because of Katoa. Katoa. I'd like to suggest a slightly different metaphor. Um, I'm not happy with this scientific reference to the double helix, and I'll explain why. Um, I'm, I'm basing this idea on my experience as a designer taking what I call New Zealand design to the world. Over the last 15 years, I've been exhibiting all around the world um, at trade fairs, mostly in Europe, but also other parts of the world. As a result of that, we now export 85% of our product, which totals about $3 million, to about 50 countries through 500 shops all around the world. That's through design. Now, I, I think this idea of a, a double helix is wrong because it's a scientific metaphor. It's a fact. We don't understand our culture, our cultural indicators, who we are through peering through a microscope in a laboratory. Now, I know this is a metaphor, but I think it's the wrong kind of metaphor. I think probably the issue here is this one of nature versus nurture. And I accept that there is an element of genetic makeup in who we are today, but every single human on the planet comes from a very few Africans from not very long ago. So we share virtually the same genes all around the world, Aborigines, Inuits, everywhere. There's more genetic diversity in neighboring tribes of chimpanzees in the jungle than there is through the whole human race. And what's made the Aborigine and Inuit different is the land they live in. That's what's formed them. I'm not actually getting any words on this. So I'll have to do it from memory. Sorry, my presenter notes aren't really showing. Um, <clears throat> I was at a conference in Adelaide in the year 2000 when this issue came up, and a number of Australian designers were bemoaning the fact that uh, we didn't, they didn't actually have an identity. And, and, uh, and what's her name? Antonelli, the director of Momo, was there, uh, Paolo Antonelli. She stood up and said, No, 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 you do. I can see it. But they couldn't see it within their own community. And I'll come back to land later, but there isn't a unique characteristic to the Australian land, like this image, which informs them and makes them who they are. Now, I think we need to be really careful about this idea of identity being something very different to branding. Identity is not a brand. Identity is an expression of who we are. A brand is an applied thing. It's created by an agency. Hopefully a good one will tell the story of who they're creating, but a bad one, and there are an awful lot of them, create a facade. Creating something like a Wild West town, <clears throat> where you have this one story from the front and an ugly tin shed around the back. And there's a real danger in the contrivance of creating brands, of telling a story, telling a spin that's not really a true story rather than an expression of who we are coming out of warts and all <clears throat> through our sense of expression. So I'd like to offer a different metaphor. Instead of DNA, I'd like to offer terroir. This is what winemakers call the unique characteristics that create a wine. You take a grape that's a French grape that makes a certain sort of wine in France. You plant it here we create a different wine. And that's caused by the different sunlight, the different climate, the different soil, the different minerals in the soil, and even crops the characters of people making it. And maybe if all you drink is this wine, you won't know that it's any different to anywhere else. You take an artist, and you take that same artist and put them in one environment, and as they imbibe and soak up all that <clears throat> characteristics of their lights and and, and the culture around them, that art will be different if you take them into a different place. Like the grapevine, the art is absorbing everything around them, the people, the culture, the environment, <clears throat> through the artistic process and creating work which speaks of that place. I think the Aboriginal art today, the women art from artists from Australia, are creating some of the most amazing art that speaks of the land, of their place, and of their time probably more than any other artist today at the time, but that's my personal opinion.
And I need to just explain my understanding of the creative process to show why this works. And I agree with um, what Kevin's, uh, uh, what uh, Noel said earlier, that uh, these words, art and design and craft, they're not. This keeps jumping, could you stop it until I press the thing? Um, <clears throat> they're not nouns, they're verbs, they're processes. And keep them are part of one creative process. And if we're doing the full creative process properly, we have to work through all those three different processes. The trouble is that today too many designers say, I'm a designer, I don't do art stuff. I don't get my hands dirty and muck around with materials, I'm a designer. But what do you design with? What's your vocabulary? What are the stories you tell from? Where does that come from? You first have to work as an artist. And find your heart, your spirit, your Tarango Waiwai, your place to speak from, your stories to tell, and the language with which to tell it. The language is your vocabulary. Then, as a designer, you now have something to design with. You use that vocabulary as your building blocks to create a structure which becomes a design. But it is unique. It is yours, of your time and of your place, because through that art process, you absorb what's around you. And you don't then create generic design. The designer who only keeps within his own world of design has no, new, no way of creating anything new, so they shuffle. They take what's already there, they shuffle it in a clever, witty, ironic way to create something new um, that is totally generic. And Michelangelo was a classic ballads, great Renaissance man. He was a consummate artist, designer, in the layout of this painting, and craftsman uh, in the way in which he prepared his pigments and his grounds so that all work still last today. So as we understand this, we can now see the difference between the new and the novel. Brancusi's sculpture from about 100 years ago was outstandingly, totally, earth-shatteringly new and different. It came out of nowhere and changed the course of sculpture for the whole 20th century and design, and we're still feeling its influence today. This work by a well-known Italian designer is a novelty. It is a shuffle, it is taking existing things and putting them together in a different way to say, oh, aren't I clever? It's a one-line joke. You laugh and you move on. You forget it very quickly. The Brancusi is beautiful. The tractor seat is clever. The, the tractor seat is a willed act. It's a rational thought process that creates it. The Brancusi can't be willed. True creativity only happens like the muse when it comes to you. You have to know and create the situation for it to happen. You can't will it to happen. And you talk to many artists, they all talk about the same thing, from Bolton to Brancusi. And this element of beauty is equally important. <clears throat> I've been giving this talk called Beauty Matters around the world for some time now. Um, <clears throat> and it's been proven that if you have something that's beautiful, you love it more, you look after it more, you care for it more, you keep it longer. The word, Maori word for beauty, te atuahoa, means <clears throat> something in between. It's not a thing, it's an intrinsic thing in itself. It's the in-betweenness between us and the object. And so that's a two-way process. It makes us beautiful if we create beautiful things. <coughs> Excuse me. So the beautiful things that we create nourish us and make us better. And the other key word <clears throat> um, apart from expression, which is the artistic process, is land. Culture is irrevocably tied up to the land, as in the Tarawa, where it comes from. New Zealand was totally changed in an outrageous act of hubris by the early settlers who wiped out the local flora and fora and implanted a British farming tradition onto this new land. We've still yet to really get our feet dirty. I don't think many Pākehā really dig their feet into the soil. No Pākehā could have written this beautiful poem by Hane Tūwhare. <coughs> we are stroking and caressing the spine of the land. We are massaging the ripped back of the land. With our sore with ever-loving feet, hell she loves it. Squirming the land wriggles in delight. We love her. So all cultures around the world speak of their time and their place through their artists. It's the artist through the art process 
who create the culture, whether it's through music, literature, visual arts in two or three dimensions. It's that creative process that generates this feeling of who we are. It can't be contrived. And within the visual arts, material is a large part of that. Henry Moore <clears throat> and his carvings <clears throat> were totally related to the walling, open, <coughs> beautiful brain of the English elm that he used mostly, the product of the English landscape. And maybe you can also see something of the worn, rounded hills of England in the forms he created. By comparison, the Maori carver in Aotearoa uses totara, a precise, even grain timber with no natural grains, so they apply their own patterns to it. It cuts cleanly and well with sharp chisels. And is it just a coincidence that these deeply incised grooves are similar to the deeply incised valleys of our newly formed land? I could tell you hundreds of stories like this from around the world of different cultures creating their own visual identity. One more from the Pacific Northwest. The indigenous people up there <clears throat> live on waterways, inland waterways. These are their highways. They know the water. The land is scary and dangerous and dark and full of bears, and they didn't go there much. And so their visual culture is expressed by what they see around them every day in the water. These patterns of reflected darkness of the forest and the sky and the land above them create these images which obviously come from that visual identity. Here in New Zealand, we have a powerfully bright light that makes dark shadows as well. I think we'll only learn to express our identity if we don't try. If it's not a conscious contrivance, but an unconscious expression of our deep feeling for our time and place through the artistic process. But first we must learn to acknowledge this. We also must learn to accept that we are a South Pacific island. We are not any more part of Britain. And if it matters to the design community, we also need to change the way we teach design to include the art process more in our design curriculums. It is not just product design that we need to do. We need to teach the designer how to express themselves so that they have a vocabulary with which to design. And then we don't create the bland, generic design which we see so much of today, or the gimmicks, the one-line jokes. And I also have to say, slightly apologetically, that I think we also need to change the way designs are judged, particularly with the best awards. The product design category has largely been influenced by technical curiosity, <coughs> excellence, and engineering, and paid very little attention to expressive design and this idea of creating our identity. And if we value this, we must change that as well. Our identity will not be found in the beguiling, glittery, but superficial surface of the water, it only revealed when we allow calmness to open up the depths. When we stop and pause, we really feel those depths. Depths of our culture, our nature, and the land, what's down deep there. And when designers stand naked as artists, revealing all their vulnerabilities, but also their special uniqueness. I say to the young designers when they ask me what's the best advice you can give, I say, be yourself. There is no one else like you. Find your place to speak from, be true to yourself, be unique, and you will by default talk of this time and place. Don't look around you and try and copy what you see. And I'd just like to end very quickly by this um, quote I saw, NZTE, some of you might have seen this, commissioned a few thinkers to come up with an expression of who they think New Zealand is, what is our authenticity. And they come up with this um, bit of writing. We're the boldest little country on the planet, we one of the biggest hearts in the world. We're spirited, switched on, often incredible, always credible. Born from the youngest, most beautiful land on earth, our attitude is unbound. Our responsibility as kaitiaki drives our care of people and place. Resourceful thinkers, game chambers, day makers, smile generators. We're still changing people's worlds because we didn't know we couldn't. I find that slightly cringeworthy, over the top. And they took this to Europe and they asked people there, what is, does this represent um, who we are? <clears throat> is this authentic, was the word they used. I think if you ask an Italian or a German, what about this? They would sort of think, oh, you're a bit of a sort of cocky young kid, aren't you? Just cool it. You don't need to do that. You've actually got so much here to offer. You don't need to push like this and claim more than you really are. Let your art speak for what it is, and it will say all that. 
We don't need to create this rah-rah stuff about who we are, but it doesn't actually work in Europe and other places. So that's my message today. Art, not science. Nurture, not nature. Thank you. Good.